Okay. Well, good afternoon again to everyone. Uh, good morning to the, those of you joining us from the West Coast. And thanks for joining us for today's COVID-19 update, strategies for maximizing COVID opportunities in 2021. Uh, this is, I believe, the fifth in a series of updates we've been doing since the pandemic hit. So to those of you who've joined us before, thanks for coming back. And to those of you who may be new, thanks for joining us. Our speakers for today, uh, in addition to myself, I'm Alex Mitchell. I'm the Quality Programs Coordinator at Bichette. I assist with things like MIPS and PAMA reporting. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Mick Rach, our CEO, and Ann Lambrix, our Vice President of Client Services. For our agenda today, uh, Mick is going to start out with a brief overview of the current environment. We're going to then turn it over to Ann, who will provide an update on the dreaded uh, 0005 uh, code and the early returns on what we've seen on that, dealing with the turnaround times, the two calendar days for uh, high throughput COVID testing. When, then we're going to uh, explore some ongoing gray areas that we've uh, been running into and I know have been causing a lot of headaches for our clients. Uh, those include a COVID specimen collection, uh, billing for those codes for independent labs, uh, understanding who can be billed in instances of workplace screening. And uh, we're going to talk about some payers who are already starting to explore the waters of applying cost sharing charges for COVID testing, which uh, many uh, still believe are exempted under the uh, FFCRA and the CARES Act requirements, even though some of that expired at the end of last year. Uh, we're also going to look at the recently passed No Surprises Act and see how that might impact laboratories when it takes effect in 2022. And we'll provide a brief update on the government relief package that the Biden administration is currently working on. And then Mick will close us out with some thoughts uh, looking forward to the coming year and years ahead. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mick. Thank you, Alex. Um, well, we've got some interesting times since we started doing this last summer. It's, uh, it's interesting to see how things have changed and how we move forward and some of the things we've learned and some of the things we still don't know. Let's talk a little bit about COVID in the government. You know, currently there's a $1.9 trillion package being proposed. Um, interesting thing is there's 800 amendments being added to that that package. So who knows how it's all going to flow out when it's said and done. This goes on top of the 900 billion that was included last December. So um, is there money behind COVID testing? Absolutely. Is there money behind the vaccine? Absolutely. That's that's not going away. An interesting thing I saw today, because um, I get questioned a lot, is, is you know when when does this end? How does how does COVID test it end? But one of the things I saw today is um, some of the uh, <clears throat> The plans that maybe domestic flights will have to have a COVID test. So if you want to fly from Michigan to Arizona, you might have to have a COVID test. And where does this land up in, in six months? Does this end up, uh, do we end up with clear, a, a pre-checked lab process where you come to the airport and you have to you have to go through your lab test and then you go through your pre-check and then you get on the plane? So that's interesting to see how that will all play out and how the government will will, will move that forward. Another thing that tied to the government is this concept of um, Obamacare and some of the subsidies that are being put in the, uh, proposed for the new package. And how does that push us towards some changes in the next 12 or 24 months? The current narr narrative is always interesting to talk about. Uh, Google does 40,000 searches a second, and <clears throat> 76% of all searches on the internet are on Google. Last year, the number one news search was coronavirus. And the number one search overall was coronavirus. So the narrative's still there. I, I'm pretty sure it's still pretty strong here in 2021. Twitter, the number one hashtag was COVID-19, followed very closely by the number two hashtag, Tiger King. So it tells you a little bit about where the narrative's at there um, and where we're going with that. Billing changes. Boy, we're seeing some interesting things in the billing world. And when I look at this, uh, I talked to a biller t today, or excuse me, yesterday, who had a had the comment that they're trying to hire people back, but they can't hire them back because unemployment pays more than than they would pay them. So we're still seeing some issues and a fallout downstream from the the unemployment subsidies that's been added on. In some places, uh, I think billers are going to struggle because of that. Medicaid, you know, between um, uh, I think December 2019 and June of 2020, Medicaid added more than 4 million people, nearly a 6% uh, 
increase nationwide. So that tells you that you're billing a different type of people now. We're dealing, billing more self-pay. We're dealing, billing more Medicaid patients. And to tie that in, you know, uh, as we go forward, the, the U6 unemployment, for example, last March was 7.4%. That's the true unemployment. That's everyone who's unemployed. And currently now it stands at 12%. So billing changes in that way. You you have to approach these patients a different way. And yet with some of the PHE rules and regulations, you can't really approach it. So it, it makes billing a very, very unique time. We're, we're tied up in a series of these mysteries of, you know, our insurance is going to pay us correctly. What are the options if they don't pay? What are the, how do you handle when the public health emergency goes away? And um, what happens if COVID payment changes come July 2021 with the new Medicare fee schedule? How will that look? Um, Many, many COVID labs are doing client billing to, to counties and, and, and companies, but when does that go away? When do they reach a point where that no longer becomes an option? And, and well, how do we handle screening tests and the billing and the collection of these tests? These are some of the things we'll, we'll hopefully provide a little bit of insight. And uh, I'm turn it over now and hand it off to Ann and let her move on forward. Thanks, Mick. Um, so the triple zero five, uh, you know, we've seen and Alex and I talk about, um, you know, all the different things that we're seeing with this new code, um, which was implemented, you know, we saw it come out uh, last year, but it is effective for dates of service, January 1, 2021. Uh, and um, uh, what I've been advising my clients is, you know, it's a two-step process to add uh, this code. Um, you have to, you know, the, the first thing to do is make sure that your previous month you've achieved 51% of, of your COVID tests have achieved that, that two calendar day turn. Um, it is still based on your collection date. And we do know that there's some, some, some conversations um, surrounding changing that, that language. Um, however, at this point, it's still the, the calculation starts um, when, when the, the specimen is, is collected and then when it is resulted. So if you're uh, within that two calendar days, um, the first check that you need to ensure is that previous month. So looking back, for example, we're in February, looking at your January uh, COVID tests. If you've achieved 51% um, uh, two calendar days, um, then you can apply that code, the U0005, to your COVID um, high throughput tests um, to your uh, existing charges. So again, in February, um, you can apply it then to your test that you've achieved that, that two calendar day turn. Some of the challenges that we've seen thus far is uh, how do you communicate to your biller that you need to add this code? Um, how is it, is it something that you add in the LIS? Do you interface that through? Um, do you, uh, do you add that to all of your charges or do you uh, pick and choose? Um, so again, these are just some questions that we've been working through some with our clients. Um, we've also, um, you know, you're, it, it is an addition, it's an add-on code. Um, one of the questions that I received just today was, is there a modifier that I need to apply? Um, from my understanding, no, no modifier. It is a separate code. You're getting paid now $75 for your high throughput test, um, which uh, again, that reimbursement switched from $100 um, through uh, dates of service 12-31-2020. Um, effective dates of service January 1, you're going to see that reimbursement go down to $75 for your high throughput test. And then again, if you hit those that criteria for the two calendar day turn, um, you can add on that U0005 um, and get a, 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 that additional $25 payment. Um, making sure, one of the things that I jotted down to make sure I, I pointed out is you need to watch your reimbursement. Um, the, it is our assumption that Medicare will pay us $25. That is, uh, from, from my understanding of the code and the pricing, um, you will be paid $25 from Medicare. And again, the, the, um, the reimbursement from managed plans will depend, again, on your, um, your cash price, um, your, uh, your contracts that you have in place. But from Medicare, you should get $25 from Medicare. Um, so making sure that you're monitoring and auditing um, that, that reimbursement early on, you potentially can catch um, errors uh, um, quickly and, and, and address. So um, most payers, most managed plans, I think that um, 
we, we initially thought that a lot of the commercial payers would not reimburse this code and what we're finding is 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 not that is not true most commercial plans the bigger ones at least are accepting the the triple five and will pay you again based on whatever contracted rate or cash price that that you have but it's good to, to be paying attention and making sure that you're addressing that with the payers um, you know understanding their policies etc and, and always be prepared for audits so again the other thing that you know i i I'm reminding everyone is to make sure that you have some process in place to support the triple five. Um, do you do you run a, a report uh, for the previous month uh, to make sure that you're achieving that 51%? How are you documenting that? Um, and, and, and if someone came in and audited and wanted to make sure that you were completing those tests within two calendar days, you have something to provide to them. Yeah, I agree. And that's going to be the key here is that if somehow the lab can go back and say, here's our documentation that we're doing this correctly. And let me ask you this question. What happens if, if I build this code and my insurance plan doesn't recognize the CPT code at all? I mean, there's so going to be situations yeah. I'm sure where smaller insurances are, aren't going to recognize it. What do you see in there? Um, then what we're what we're finding is is that the the payer should have some sort of policy online that you can go and, and check and see um, it's typically under their covid reimbursement schedule um, if they haven't added this u0005 it may uh, take a phone call to that payer to determine whether or not they will pay for it so mick there's nothing that um, guarantees a lab reimbursement for this code except by Medi Medicare. Um, and so managed plans are not uh, required to add this code. Um, the good news is we are seeing that, that many are, but to your point, there will be some that, that won't. So it, it is really, um, again, the labs understanding their payer mix and, and um, if there are you know, a large payer that's not paying this, that's going to significantly reduce your, your return on, this, on the, the high throughput test. And one point of clarification I wanted to make here, since uh, I think we still see a lot of confusion around this, is that initially there was a lot of language calling this the 48-hour rule. And I think a lot of folks got stuck on the idea that, okay, we have to turn these tests around within 48 hours of collection in order to be eligible. Well, the better way to think of it and the, the language that Ann was using is two calendar days. But a further clarification on that even is that collection day is day zero. So the day after collection day is day one, and the following day is day two, when the result must be completed by. Uh, sound like I'm correct there, Ann? Yes, and, and I, I appreciate you clarifying that. And another, a lot of questions we have is, is um, you know, going back to that 48 hour rule, if you look at the language within the rule, um, it, it doesn't specify hours. So in theory, you could have more than 48 hours. Is that correct, Alex? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. If, if say the test uh, was collected at 8 a.m. on a Wednesday, that entire day is day zero. You could almost have 72 hours at that point. You would have mm -hmm. until midnight on that Friday to uh, turn it around in your technically two calendar days. And, and I know that, like I mentioned, I know that um, really there's been lobbying to change that from the calendar day, I'm sorry, the collection day to the received day. And I don't know if that's gaining much traction. Um, and again, I know we'll talk further on, on some additional legislation that's moving forward um, with the new administration. Um, but but that, is, that is something that I know labs are, are looking for to, because they can't always control that collection date when they receive the, 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 the specimen. So one of the things that um, we continue to, I guess, further development of these uh, codes, the, the collection co codes, so G2023 and 2024, um, which were developed and um, uh, introduced in, in 2020 to support, or I would say the intent of the codes was to reimburse labs for the additional cost example for PPE that's needed or again just um, further lab laboratory personnel to be um, collecting uh, and, and being exposed to to COVID patients. So uh, again to encourage um, 
and, and to make sure that these residents weren't having to go out and expose the general population. Um, they're encouraging labs to go into the, the facility to, to do the collection. Um, I think that what we're finding is again, the language. And so the language, when I say the language, um, the, the intent, the understanding of the development of these codes, as well as if you look in coding, for example, supercoder, the, 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 the verbiage surrounding these particular codes um, doesn't always mirror with the actual FAQ discussing. So the, the HHS publication of, of the use, the appropriate use of this code. Um, and so again, this is just something that, that has been coming up and, and you know, we certainly always encourage to understand again, the intent of these codes and, and to make sure that you have a, a firm grasp if you, are, if you are using these codes, that, that it is, it is uh, clinically supported and um, um, you are following that, that intent. Um, Alex, can you maybe speak a little bit to um, what you, we feel uh, maybe will be further developed in this month um, with the, the new um, COVID relief package that's, that's going on? Yeah, yeah, and whether or not it happens in the next uh, you know, month or it takes a little longer, uh, we're going to have a slide on it later, but uh, I think what Ann tr really wants to highlight here is as the Biden administration works on their next COVID relief bill, what we're hoping to see is more clarity coming around issues like this, uh, use of the, the specimen collection codes, uh, use of U0005, and just a number of other gray areas mm -hmm. that have developed, uh, especially with the expiration of the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act on December 31st. Um, there are certain portions of that, like uh, paid family leave that uh, expired, and folks are now kind of looking for more guidance on. In some of those items, uh, we've explicitly seen that the administration has, has said that they intend to address in this next package. So we're hoping it's um, you know, very comprehensive in, in regard to covering some of those gray areas. Right. Anything else? Okay, workplace screening. Um, if th this has been a topic, a long time topic of discussion um, over the, the course of the, the COVID um, testing and, and reimbursement. Um, you know, workplace screening, defining workplace screening, uh, if you look at the FAQ that was pushed out uh, June 23rd, um, it really does. Uh, uh, speak um, very uh, detailed on what they would call surveillance screening and back to work testing. So, you know, workplace screening and, and, and really, again, another gray area of what defines a workplace screen and, and, and actually what is a screen versus uh, the there's an outbreak in a facility and um, potentially everyone is at risk. So we need to test all of our residents, all of our employees. And so that is where, again, it's, it's very gray. And, and we've always leaned on the more, uh, 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 on the side of you, you really should not be um, submitting to insurance companies, workplace screening. If you're screening all residents or screening all employees, um, it's very difficult to uh, substantiate medical necessity. Um, and so our concern is, is again, the risk of audit. Um, but again, we are hoping for some, some further clarification and some further, um, hopefully, uh, some, some better reimbursement for the type of testing where we are trying to screen to prevent, uh, again, risk of exposure. Yeah, I think this is where, you know, the, the government's goal of getting everyone tested, get everyone tested, get everyone tested, runs right into the the problem with a, uh, a bureaucracy uh, run by millions of people in the government, you know, so we have this, hey, let's get everyone tested, let's run these screens. And then we have these rules saying, well, maybe not, we shouldn't be paid by the pay for this. So uh, hopefully something else will come out soon, because, you know, we're still seeing many sites where they test every employee on the first and 15th of the month, just to make sure. And uh, I mean, how that all plays out going forward, it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be, I, I feel the 2022 will be the year of the COVID audit. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of time uh, working with labs, defending their, their billing practices during their the, the two previous years as people try to figure out this and hopefully with some clarity out of the next the, the next bill will know a little bit better going forward. 
Right. And, and I really, I, I do always support, you know, the um, uh, best practices or doing your due diligence to document your process. Um, because there's so much gray area, um, if there was an audit, if you're able to show that in good faith, you've, you've attempted to uh, interpret the rule to the best of your ability, um, that goes a long way. So, um, you know, that's what I encourage at this point is, is whether you disagree with, with, again, my more conservative approach to not bill for workplace screening, um, and you take it as, is again, it's more of an exposure. Everybody's been exposed to COVID within the facility. We're going to, we're going to bill insurance. Um, make sure that you have had a, uh, again, a second opinion, you document that, um, and, and you are, you, you're doing your due diligence to make sure that there's some, some documentation supports, again, an outbreak within a facility and the reason why um, all residents or all employees need to be tested at the frequency level that, that again, like Mick said, you know, weekly or, or every other week. Um, doing and, and documenting and showing that you're intending to, to comply and, and, and again, not overutilize and um, uh, overbill. Um, in these types of situations, I think will we'll, we'll be very good for labs going forward. Okay, so cost sharing. I think one of the things that came up this this past week is um, we identified actually one of our clients let us know that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, I'm sorry, of Texas, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, um, their policy as of 1 1 of 21 um, indicated that um, they were going to start applying cost sharing. So the patient out of pocket would now um, resume. Um, and as we all are well aware, for the past year, um, most insurance plans actually due to the CARES Act and, and the FFCRA, um, they had to waive cost sharing for COVID tests and treatment. Um, when researching it, um, I identified again that the, the, really the cost sharing waiver um, really was outlined within the FFCRA, the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act, which did expire the end of last year. Um, and so despite the fact that that applied, there's some language within the FFCRA that basically indicated that that waiver should apply as long as a public health emergency exists. So I think that you know these are grounds for appeal with the payers, um, but what we are hoping for is that um, you know again further clarification and maybe further uh, um, uh, they they extend out these these types of waivers or these rules um, through hopefully the end of this year um, because we are still seeing a, you know, a lot of COVID testing and it, it really should be applicable. So. Again, please keep in mind, you really should be looking at your reimbursement um, and if the, the payer is starting to apply, you know, out of pocket. It, again, in the past, we, we saw that, you know, the payer wanted the CS modifier to waive the cost sharing and then a lot of payers kind of, you know, moved away from that and it was just implied that because it was a COVID test, it would be paid at 100%. Again, as of 1-1, your payers may decide that they want to start um, applying um, uh, cost sharing. So there will be a, um, a, a deductible or co-insurance depending on their policy. Then the question asks, you know, if, if, if the patient has a, a deductible that's applied for COVID, can you bill that to the patient if you accepted money for provider relief? So these are all good questions that unfortunately I don't have a, a, a concrete answer, but this is why we're looking for an extension to this, this uh, cost sharing uh, relief or waiver from these insurance companies. Um, United Healthcare, we do see that United Healthcare is extending their cost sharing through the end of the PHE. Um, so, and again, we expect that that will probably extend, be extended through the end of the year. And I would assume that many other big, um, big payers will also, um, again, use the PHE um, uh, and, and use that as their um, benchmark for, for waiving cost sharing. Um, Lisa McCrory just indicated that Cigna extended theirs as well this week. So that's good. Thanks, Lisa. Um, but what we do want to point out is just make sure that you're looking at that, looking at you know uh, your COVID tests after the beginning of the year, and and really uh, 
um, working out what your policy will be if the payer um, does apply a patient out of pocket. Yeah, and here's one thing I think we're going to find early next year when we start uh, auditing some of our labs. We're going to find, once this goes away, we're going to find billers that forget to turn it back on. And we're going to find situations where these are written off. And I guarantee you come March of next year, we'll audit uh, some lab and we'll find millions of dollars that were that were never balance billed forward because uh, because someone forgot to turn this back on. You know, it again, the, the rules keep changing and uh, it's up to the billers and billing staff and billing companies out there to to try to keep their uh, their head in the game and, and keep things tracked going forward. OK. Now we'll briefly touch on the uh, No Surprises Act that feels like it was passed a lifetime ago with the last COVID relief package in December, uh, the way the weeks drag on these days. But there'd been a, a cry for a federal balance billing fix for a long time uh, from a lot of different sectors and a, a lot of different interested parties. Um, so we finally got that uh, hammered out uh, in December. Now we, the way it will interact with the patchwork of state laws that are currently in existence uh, for states that already have a balanced billing law in the book is that in most instances, those state laws are going to supersede uh, the No Surprises Act here. But what the act uh, generally does is that it will prevent patients from being uh, balanced billed in emergency scenarios or uh, non-emergent situations when the patient uh, didn't have reasonable access to an in-network provider. Uh, in those situations, the patients will only be responsible for their in-network cost-sharing responsibility. Uh, now, the provider may uh, ask the patient, an out-of-network provider may ask the patient to consent ahead of time to receiving care uh, if they could provide a cost estimate in uh, at least 72 hours in advance of care and the patient provides written consent. Um, in those instances, when the provider and the uh, Patients insurer can't uh, agree on a price. An independent IDR process is available uh, when a payment rate can't be reached within 30 days. Uh, during that process, a third party will consider the rate proposed by each side. It'll take into uh, consideration different factors such as the median in network rate for the services provided and a number of other variables. Uh, as I said, the state laws uh, that are currently in place will generally supersede uh, prior to the IDR process if there is a dispute. And this takes effect on January 1st of 2022. So Mick and Ann, I wanted to ask, how, how might we see this uh, impact labs? Yeah, that, I wanted to jump in here. Um, here's an interesting thing. Let's say you're out of network and you're struggling to get paid and your state passes a surprise billing law or, or you fall under the national surprise billing law, now you can go through the independent dispute uh, resolution process and, and find a way to get paid. And in some cases, this might turn out to be a, a beneficial situation, you know, where a payer was paying you maybe 40% of Medicare, you might be able to, I know some states have it up to 150% of Medicare on some of their payments. So the, there could be a silver lining in here. It's, it's, we're, it, this is very, very early to tell, and we're obviously fighting through all the COVID stuff first, but there's going to come a time later this year, maybe early next year, when we actually test this, we run, run through this process with some of our groups, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Ann, what do you think? I think that the, you know, again, the challenge um, with labs is if, um, you know, agreed, Mick, that they may be able to get a higher rate than what potentially a contract would be. However, um, we have many payers that, um, again, will not pay anything out of network and they have narrow networks. So I'm interested to see how this will affect labs um, because uh, a lot of labs are out of network, but it's, uh, because the payer won't allow them to be in network. So if they're, um, you know, again, the, the, it will be interesting to see how this all plays out and if there will be additional language that, that addresses, um, you know, non-hospital-based uh, ancillary providers. All right, well, thanks for chipping in there, Ann. One second here, let me get my slides back up. There we go. Okay, and now just a quick rundown of some of the different uh, government relief updates, uh, including the uh, new uh, Biden relief bill that we'll be looking at. Um, 
with the HHS Provider Relief Fund, there was originally a reporting deadline that was in place. Uh, February 15th was when recipients of uh, those funds were going to have to uh, report on their use of the funds. Uh, that deadline has now been pushed to a date to be announced later. So what HHS is asking at this time is a reporting portal has been opened on their provider relief website. They're asking uh, any recipients who received uh, $10,000 or more in total payments across the different distributions to go on now and to register to re prepare to report when the deadline is announced at a later date. So a bit of a confusing process, but essentially when the last COVID relief bill passed in December, HHS recognized that there would likely be a need for additional time and they kick that can down the road. So good news uh, in terms of everything else that uh, I'm sure you're all dealing with at this time. Uh, when we talk about the Biden administration's relief bill, uh, they're looking at a roughly $1.9 trillion stimulus package. And they took steps earlier this week. Uh, there was a, a Republican proposal uh, from a small group that was at roughly $600 billion. Uh, that was a, an attempt by about 10 Republican senators to uh, see if they could strike a bipartisan deal to get 60 votes through. Um, it looks like the Biden administration has signaled, though, that that is too far off from their number. And with the party's ability to pass uh, on 50 votes uh, via budget reconciliation uh, process, they look like they're going to move forward and do that. So the budget reconciliation process essentially lets uh, a, a vote be passed on anything to do with taxation or the budget that instead of needing the 60 votes that would be required to break a filibuster, the a party can pass uh, those moves with just 50 votes. So with the Democrats having 50 senators and the tie breaking vote with the vice president, they could uh, potentially pass their $1.9 trillion package along a strict party line vote as long as everyone is willing to go along with it. There are a few moderate moderates though that uh, may have to be convinced of some different things so that remains to be seen. But looking at the package um, as it's currently been presented, we'd see roughly $20 billion for a national vaccine program uh, that would establish uh, community vaccination centers in urban areas in addition to rural uh, mobile units. It'd be an additional $50 billion for testing. Uh, there, money to hire an additional 100,000 healthcare workers, $15 billion to replenish the Paycheck Protection Program, and restoration of the emergency paid leave that expired with the FFCRA. So while you're going, most of the discussion you're going to see about this package is going to focus on things like the $15 minimum wage and uh, $1,400 checks for individuals. Um, there is a lot of other items, including uh, aid to state and local governments that uh, this package will also tackle. Um, not in, in case you missed it, the public health emergency was recently extended again until mid-April. Um, we have seen some senior administration officials reach out to the governors and uh, say that that uh, PHE is most likely going to be extended throughout the uh, remainder of 2021, possibly even into 2022 at this point. Um, and so as long as that remains in effect, all applicable waivers uh, do as well. So those pertain to Stark Law, telehealth, and numerous other areas. So it's just best to begin thinking about how your practices might have to change a little bit when those waivers are revoked. Um, different things like uh, Medicare covering a single test without a physician's order, those things would be revoked when the PHE expires. However, it doesn't look like that's going to be any time in the near future. And uh, one final note, the 2020 MIPS deadline for anyone who did not receive an exemption is uh, March 31st. So be sure to get your reporting and uh, improvement activity attestation submitted. Nick or Ann, anything you wanted to add on this slide? Nope, looks good. All righty. Well then Mick, I will turn it over to you to close us out. Okay, um, boy, there's a, there's a lot of here. So uh, let's let's just look into crystal ball for a second and say, how does this all end? You know, um, at what time will, will the money run out for COVID testing? And and when will, when will it become something that becomes um, an everyday thing? I mean, there's 61 million 
home test kits being developed right now? And how does that play into the, the, the treatment of this, this pandemic going forward? And, you know, at what point do we say, you know, as the new strains are developed, do we, do we just keep testing and how does that all play out? So I look at when, when the money runs out and we look at, um, you know, this is, unfortunately, if you look at COVID testing, it falls right into the bad part of our fee for service schedule. Right, it's, we're pay per click, and we can run millions of tests and get paid. and And we're not looking at utilization here. We're not, or we haven't figured out how to tighten this this bolt down. So, will the government keep funding this, or will they come out in June or July with their new Medicare fee schedule and say, "Hey, we're, you know, we don't think this is a top priority, and we're going to lower this down 50 percent"? And how does that play in the market, and, and what are the results going forward from that? You know, who who benefits? Who will benefit the most here? Um, I think. The, the labs we've seen that are benefiting the most and the groups we've seen are the ones that are that are proactive and they're aggressive. They pay attention to the marketplace and they get aggressive when things happen. Um, I love the, the Steve Jobs, I think, quote, that, or was it? Yeah, maybe Steve Jobs has said, you know, we overreact whatever it's going to happen in two years and we underreact what's going to happen in 10 years. Look 10 years down the road. What does COVID testing look like in, in you know, 2031 is it be, is it something that we do before we enter every any mall or a movie theater or, or airport um what will it look like then and how will that be part of our collective going forward and finally the the question i i always ask myself is like what have we learned from this when it's all said and done and the, one of the rules is to follow the money well if you look at um, hca a big hospital corporation they came out and said that their profits were up 7.1 percent for last year even though their emissions were down 4.7 percent the revenue per admission was up 10.5%. So do you think COVID pays? Yeah, it does. And uh, what are the implications of that? And, and how does this, how did it, how can this um, perhaps overuse of our fee-for-service system lead into the narrative to a, a, a national health plan that's coming in the future? Could this be the narrative that drives that? Could this be the narrative that pushes that forward? So, and that's that's kind of when you look at the really big picture, that's something I, I say is, you know, as the collective says, look, our, our national lab testing processes weren't correct. We weren't ready for this. We couldn't handle it. Maybe a national health plan could handle it. Maybe that's maybe that's a narrative that we use going forward. Any other comments from you, Ann or, or Alex? No, I 100% I agree, Mick. I think this is moving us into um, potentially uh, the, the next phase or the next uh, uh, that, that national health strategy. And it does make sense that that might be, uh, again, um, the, the shift that things are going towards. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, if you, we tried to answer whatever questions came up during the webinar, but if you have an outstanding issue that you wanted to shoot over to us, uh, you can email Mick, his address is right there, myself, uh, where the registration came from. We will get those uh, forwarded out, most likely over to Ann, and try to get a response back to you. But other than that, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks again for hopping on. Thank you, Alex.